thank you once again for your attention. So uh, first, some preliminary comments. Yesterday, some of you, if you, uh, uh, I think it's a little bit delayed. Eh? No, no, but like this, we cannot do right, Nathan. There is an echo there. Great, so now we also have our, our own last track. We are in a comedy series now, people. <laughs> this, is, this is Friends, IFT edition. But oh, echo. Hot. Então, então tudo bem. Actually, this is nice. I, I need this in my life, you know? My own, my own comedy last track. Alô, alô? <laughs> alô, again? But there is a delay, right? Vo tentar falar alguma coisa? Okay, so I think now it works. It was funnier before, but it will be more effective now. So some of you asked uh, yesterday if there were exercises on this subject. So uh, this is experimental physics. There is no such thing as exercise. You can open up the reference and, uh, <coughs> and uh, try to read the theory and do some of the exercises there. But that does, that's not quite, uh, it's nice, it's useful, but uh, that's not really the skill, right? What, uh, if you really want to uh, start getting dirty with the, with the subject, what you have to do is that you can try to download some of those uh, tools of the trade that I showed you yesterday. They should be easy to run and to install and run. And you should try to, it, all of them come with tutorials, and you should try to start running some of those tutorials. If any of you is uh, worried about the exam, of course, the exam, you don't have a computer, you're not going to run anything. So it will be, it has to be, it cannot be anything else more than conceptual uh, questions, okay? So, but if you, if you want to start getting the skills, download and run the, the tools. Okay, uh, so for today, I'm going to talk about the, the actual tools of the trade, accelerators and detectors. And the very first thing that uh, we may ask ourselves is, but why accelerators? Why do we need accelerators to study uh, the realm of subatomics of uh, fundamental particles? I could make a very detailed answer, but I think sometimes the simplest is easier. We need accelerators because we need to give high energy to the particles. And why do we need to give high energy to the particles? Be simply because of this. You want to probe smaller distance. Particles are small. Some particles are point-like, as far as we know, but even protons and stuff like that, they are small. So if you want to probe them, you need small uh, wavelengths. And with small wavelengths, as you know from quantum mechanics, is high energy. On the other hand, if you want to produce new particles that usually don't exist in the universe around us, remember, only the first family makes up most of uh, everyday matter. You need, again, energy because of Einstein's relation. Only that. So you need accelerators. Now, what kind of accelerators? And I'm going to spend a little bit speaking about this. The immediate first choice that you have to make when you are designing and building an accelerator is if you are going with a collider uh, geometry versus a fixed target experiment. What, how do you do this? Suppose uh, you are colliding particles. Nossa, Roberto, eu sou péssimo. The resolution is horrible. Suppose you are colliding particles, and they have this four momenta here, uh, M1, E1, P1, M2, E2, P2. Then you calculate the total relativistic energy available. 
Now, this is high energy physics. That means that these two first terms that are only the rest mass of the particles should be small. Protons have this mass of one GeV for accelerating something 30 times more. It's energy, you can safely discard the rest mass. Now, this is just sum of four momentum in the taking square roots, okay? There is no real calculation here. If you assume collision of a beam particle is a fixed target, you substitute these numbers and you get the total energy available is only the square root of the energy of the beam. So here, for instance, if you have something like the Tevatron or the SCF, the beam is at 450 GeV, the target at rest, the available energy is around 30 GeV. On the other hand, if you collide two beam particles, then both of them collide head on in opposite direction, then you have the full energy available. It's just that. Oh, Tiago, but why does anybody do fixed target experiments nowadays? Two reasons. First, it's easier to prepare one beam and send it to collide to bulk matter, to a block of iron, let's say, than to focus two beams and make them collide head on. So in this particular sense, it's easier to do a fixed target experiment. The second reason is that, we will speak more about this later, but the rate of collisions is, in a, is proportional to the density of the material that you are colliding on. If you are colliding with solid iron, solid iron has more or less 10 to 9 times 10 to the 28 uh, atoms per square per cubic meter, while the bunches of, the, of protons that the LHC collide have one proton per cubic meter. And yeah, most of this is just Avogadro's number. So you have to make trade-offs, energy, luminosity, energy collision rate, easy, how easy it is to make the collision, how much money do you have available? Remember, this is the real world. You have to buy these things. How do you accelerate? Well, charged particles, you have to accelerate them with electric fields. You don't have much of a choice there. And there is a caveat. You cannot accelerate a particle that is stable enough to actually survive during the acceleration process. Does it mean that it has to be absolutely stable? Not necessarily, but it has to fly long enough to actually get where you need it. You can accelerate muons, okay, but it's complicated. You definitely can accelerate protons and electrons. So it, the first idea is that you could make a linear accelerator and have this kind of structure here, which is called a, which is called a radio frequency cavity, RF cavity. And the idea is that this, the field inside here oscillates, but there are safe regions, the so-called drift fields. The, here is a proton, so the proton comes through here, when the wave is coming, pushing on this direction, it feels the, the force. When the wave turns around and it would be breaking the proton, it's actually safely hidden inside the drift fields. So it only ever feels the, the accelerating force and never the decelerating one. This is the basic, uh, the basic acceleration element. You could make easier things, okay? Obviously, if you put a giant voltage in between two plates, of course, you leave a pro you put a proton here, and you and it will accelerate to the other side. This is obvious. But then you have to deal with the giant voltage, 20 megavolts, and it's not something that you can easily make. Uh, there is one problem with linear accelerators. First, if you actually want to get to high energies, then you have to combo these things one after the other. And they can get long, really, really long. We will see examples later. The other thing is that if you collide the two beams, or if you collide with the fixed target, you collide and it's over. You lose the, you lose the beam. An alternative to this is circular accelerators like the Tevatron, which is up there, by the way. This one's not, the, the one here is the main injector. I'll speak more about it later. If you want, you can set the, your accelerating elements in a circle, 
and keep the beam circulating here again over and over and over and over again, crossing the beams and having collisions with the same beam again and again and again and again. Which is, in a sense, much better, except for some problems that we'll see later. The first thing that now, besides electric fields for uh, particle acceleration, we also need magnetic fields to make the particles turn. This is simple, you know this from electromagnetism. But remember, you're accelerating, and that means that the magnetic field strength that you need in order to make the particle turn also changes, because the momentum of your particle is also changing. At some point, the speed doesn't matter anymore. Particles in the LHC, they're moving at 99.99 to 1% of the speed of light. But the momentum matters. The momentum keeps go growing and growing. Because the gamma, the relativistic gamma, go gets growing. So you need different fields. You need different field strengths. And you have to synchronize this with the particle acceleration. So you have to synchronize those radio frequency cavities here with the current that is feeding the magnets that give you the magnetic field that makes your particles turn. And this synchronization has to be almost perfect or else if, if you don't have your field exactly, exactly set, the particles make a turn a bit too large and then you lose the beam. Plus it depends on, remember, it depends on the momentum. So what kind of uh, magnet do you need? Well, if you have different particles, for instance, an EP collider like, he, like Hera was, or if you have both particles in the of the same charge, then you need different magnets, one for each beam. On the other hand, if you go with particle and antiparticle, for instance, proton-antiproton, electron-positron, then you can use the same magnetic field because one is moving in one direction and the other is moving in the other. So you need just one tube with one set of magnets, which is easier, right? Half the magnets, half the price, half the complexity. But you have a problem. You, as you may have noticed, <laughs> antimatter is not exactly something which you just find lying over there. You have to produce it and producing antimatter anti means you have to make some kind of reaction to get it. For positrons, it's easy, on the sense that you can get them from instance shining some light on material, something with a laser or something like that, and you can get this reaction here. Antiprotons, however, they are more difficult because you have to make a nuclear reaction, so you have to collide protons with nuclei and hope that it gives you a reaction that gets some, uh, that gives you antiprotons. Anti and then you have to get those antiprotons and gather them and eventually make a beam out of them. So it's more complicated. This reason is the reason that getting antiprotons is not trivial is why, for instance, the LHC collides protons on protons because we wanted high luminosity, high rate of free, high collision rates. Therefore, we couldn't make do with uh, just few bunches of antiprotons. We needed, we needed a much stronger beam. And that led us to go with proton-proton. Um, what are the accelerator components in the, in the case of a synchrotron? By the way, yeah, synchrotron is one of the ways that you do the synchronization. Not going even to touch about the others, but all the modern circular accelerators, they are what's called synchrotrons. Well, you need, you need accelerators, right? You need the high radio frequency cavities, which are usually made from niobium, so it's not only for trinkets and bubbles, it's actually useful for something else. But you, the problem is that, consider for instance the International Linear Collider. It's a proposed collider that's supposed to be built in Japan with a center of mass energy of 500 GeV. The accelerating cavities, are designed to give you uh, an, accelera uh, an acceleration of 35 megavolts per meter. And acceleration is not probably the right unit, but it doesn't matter. Because 
if you want 500 GV beams, how many of these do you have to put one after the other? The answer is that you need kilometers, okay? <laughs> so it's large. Then you need magnets. You need dipoles to bend the beam. In, in the case of the LHC, and I think in the Tevatron it was also the case, you need, you have superconducting dipoles. They are, they, so they are, they have to be at uh, cryogenic temperatures with very high field, eight Fs is a lot, and long. But again, this is a simple exercise. If you say, if you tell me that you want the, the proton energy to, to be 70 EV, then again, you, you run the, the calculation of how much, uh, how is the, what's the spinning radius or gyration radius of a particle with that energy for that field, and you can get the ring circumference. And you'll see again that it is in the order of kilometers. So it's big either way. And besides the dipoles, you also have quadrupoles that help you focus the beam. Remember, if you want to collide the two beams, you would like them to be as dense as possible, which is not much, right? Because it's one proton per cubic meter. But it is what, we, what it is. So you have to focus them, and what you use to do that is quadrupoles like this. Now, if you actually run the calculations in this kind of a thing, you will notice that it's impossible to focus in both directions. So in this configuration here, you see that in the horizontal it's focusing, and in the vertical it's by focusing. These uh, arrows here are the force that a particle coming out of the, of the screen would be feeling. Oh, Thiago, so it's impossible, you cannot focus. The answer is that there is something called a photo cell that uh, you, you set two of these with a 90 degree uh, rotation. And then you can tune them such that the overall uh, effect is to focus the beam in the two directions. Accelerator physics or an optics of uh, particle beams is a super hard subject. And uh, for instance, I don't do that, okay? I do detectors and analysis. But uh, without that, without accelerator, there is no show to be run. So uh, it's at least useful for everybody to have an idea on how these things work. So it's focusing empty, the focusing and empty. And in the empty regions, what we actually have is dipoles. And these are the actual pictures of the thing. So here, these radio frequency cavities of a different type, but the underlying, the underlying principles are more or less the same. The, the, here's electrons. The electrons never feel the, the breaking force. And you see it here, made of niobium. This is one of the LHC dip dipoles being lowered down because the LHC is underground. And this is one of the quadrupoles. And you see here that here, and here, there are the two holes where the particles go through. Since the LHC is proton-proton, you have two separate, uh, two separate uh, beam pipes. And then when you want to collide, you mix them, you merge them, and you tune the optics of the accelerator. And it's really, we call it really optics because the equations that uh, determine the orbit of the charged particle, they are very similar to the equations of uh, geometrical optics. And then you merge the two in the interaction points in the detector. There is one more problem with synchrotrons. As you may remember from electromagnetism, accelerated particles radiate. Accelerated particles in circular orbit radiate in a pattern which is synchrotron radiation. And this is the formula here, okay? You can open up Jackson and, uh, and look it up. It's important to notice this term here, one over m to the fourth. To the fourth, this means that light particles, when they are accelerated in a circular orbit, they radiate much, 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 much more than uh, heavy particles. And uh, with today's, or the near past technology, 
we couldn't really go above 100 GeV per beam for, electro, for an electron positron machine. This was the large electron positron collider that came before the LHC in the same tunnel lab. Then all higher energy machines like the Tevatron and the LHC, they are, they are hadron colliders. They collide protons or ions if you want to study high energy nuclear physics. The International Linear Collider that I just spoke about is a machine, is a precision machine to collide electrons and positrons. And that's why it has to be uh, linear. There are proposals in the table to actually make something after the LHC in the commission to make something called LAP3, again a circular accelerator. But they are still in very preliminary studies. Of course, Synchrotron radiation is useful in its own regard. It's a very special kind of light that can be used, for instance, for material uh, studies. So, as many of you probably may know, Brazil is on the verge of commissioning the most advanced synchrotron in the world, Sirius in Campinas. And when I say most advanced, it's not an exaggeration. In its class, so for the, for the parameters of the, of the light that Sirius is going to, to give, it's the most advanced in the whole world. It's literally a world-class facility. So nice, some pride for us. This is a picture of the, of the this is completed already, okay? It's on the final stages of commissioning, I think. And another thing is that one easier way to do this uh, acceleration through high energy, like 70 V per beam, is that you recommission the accelerators as feeders one to the other. So, proton synchrotron was the first uh, accelerator that fell in 1959. It feeds the SPS, which is from 1976, and the SPS feeds the LHC from 2008. So each of these, and around here, the, the, the has to be a Linux here. The Linux is the linear accelerator. And in, and in the beginning of the accelerator, of course, you have a bottle of uh, hydrogen gas that gives you the proton, something like this. So each of these feeds the next, and they only accelerate up to some energy. And then the beam is diverted to the next accelerator. So SPS goes until 450 GZ, PS I don't remember. All labs that, uh, that do accelerator physics do it like this because it's, uh, besides these accelerators it's still being used to do experiments on their own right, it's a more cost-effective cost way to do, the, to do the experiment. After all, remember, these things are gigantic and uh, cost billions. Okay, so fine, we have accelerators. We, are, we have high energy particles flying through each other. As we saw on the last lecture, they collide, and uh, hopefully a bunch of particles will come out from that collision. How do we detect them? The first thing that we have to note is that not every particle that comes out from the collision can be detected. The first and obvious thing is that it has to exist for a long enough time to fly and reach our detector. You cannot put a detector micrometers around the collision point. It's impossible, even because the collision point is not sta so stable that it doesn't move a little bit. So let's say it has to fly at least 15 centimeters. Actually, most particles are unstable, so we actually have to care about a few of them. Which ones? Proton, electron, photon, and neutron, they are stable, okay? So these guys fly, fly forever. The neutrino hardly interacts, so we're not going to count, uh, to count on it anymore. The others, neutron, neon, the K0 long, the pion, and the charged K, so K0 long is neutral, the pion, this pion that I'm talking about here is charged. There is a neutral pion, but it decays almost instantly into two photons. And the, and the charged kilns, everybody in this list lives for at least 10 nanoseconds. 
And they are producing, they, are, they have a lot of energy, so let's make the approximation that they are flying at the speed of light. So 10 nanoseconds times the speed of light, three meters. Everybody else doesn't fly enough. Oh, but Tiago, you should be making the calculation that uh, it actually it has to, you have to take into account that they're flying very close to the speed of light, so proper time, they should decay in their own rest frame. Yeah, whatever. Doesn't matter for these, for these particular calculations. That's not going to save you. Yeah, the MIO actually flies much more because it's flying close to, to the speed of light. No one cares. Three, in this context, three meters is more than enough for us. And then there are two divisions to be done here on the particle that we want to detect. Either they are charged or they are neutral. Or they are hadrons. That means that they interact with the remnants of the quantum chromodynamics with the strong interaction. Or they are not. All of the others we cannot detect. So how do, inclu including the infamous Higgs boson. So how do we know that they exist? And the answer is that we reconstruct them. You know that, for instance, a Z boson can decay into two leptons, two electrons, for instance. So you detect the electrons, get the, the kinematics, the momentum, the, the momentum, the energy, sum the four vectors, and you will notice, we will see this in the data analysis section. You will notice that there is a large number of uh, electron positron pairs that have the invariant mass of the Z boson. So it's something like this. If you were to make a histogram, experimental physics, if you were to make a histogram, you would see something like this. With this more or less 90 GZ. So this is how you detect uh, the particles that don't leave enough. But what does it mean, detect? We are macroscopic. We build macroscopic things. So you have to make your particles interact with bulk matter, with big blocks of matter, which are sensitive to the passage of the particles in the matter. Uh, and what, and what the, after they interact, they make something to this matter. Either they make it shine, either they make some electric signal. To transform these signals into something that we can understand is another problem, it's reconstruction. How to, say, how to transform the information that your little block of crystal shines, shown, with to the information that an electron passes through there. This is something else we will see on Tuesday. But the first thing we have to understand is how do element, uh, fundamental particles, or particles in general, interact with matter. So here we go. This is the bat block equation. That's where every, everything begins. And it describes with very good approximation the energy loss of a charged heavy particle when it interacts with matter. It is semi-empirical. There are some uh, ad hoc terms, in a sense. But this part here, you can more or less derive from first principles. But you can see it's complicated. So let's unpack this a little bit. You see here that it depends on the Lorentz factor, tau gamma and beta. It depends on the classical electron radius, plus the charges, the atomic and nuclear number of the target, the density, the constant. I speak about this mean excitation energy later. The maximum energy transfer. So let's say that a particle is interacting with an atom. If you, may, if you run the kinematics of it, there is a maximum energy that can be transferred in one single collision. It depends on that, plus the dot correction. The mean excitation energy here, this I, is the hard part. Because how does, it, how does the charged particle interact? It interacts with the atom. It, it interacts mostly with the electrosphere of the atoms, or in the case of a, of a metal, for instance, it interacts with the electrons that are delocalized and make up the, the, the metal. 
And the question is, when the particle passes through, it excites the electron. What's the mean of this ex excitation energy? This is extremely material dependent, extremely model dependent. In general, it's a pain. But let's assume that we manage to either calculate or measure it. So now we have this equation. And this is how much energy the particle loses as a function of how deep it goes inside the matter, which is exactly what we, what we want. Notice that if we integrate this thing, we can see, how, how we can calculate how long the particle can go until it stops because it lost all of its energy. And this is the, this you can use to calculate the range of, uh, of the particle inside, uh, inside matter. This is important, for instance, in case you are designing, let's say, something like a shield for a nuclear reactor. But it's not important for us because we have to know how big our detector has to be in order to stop the particles. This is how it looks like, actually. And it's a good description for, B, let's, let's use gamma beta here as a scaling in between 0 0.1 and 1,000. So it's five orders of magnitude, and it's nice. There are three regions here. First, it drops to a minimum. Then it rises logarithmically, and eventually it will reach a plateau. So if ionization and excitation of the electrons in the bulk matter were the only effect in play, it would plateau. Why is it a good description only until beta gamma equals 2,000? And what does beta gamma equal 2,000 translate to? This is neons on copper, okay? Uh, you see here this auxiliary ruler here that tells you that up to neons around 100 GV. Remember that the mass of the neon is something on the, on the order of 100 MeV, so ultra relativistic neons. But then a new process comes into play, and that's Bremsstrahlung. Notice here that now I change it here because, uh, to energy loss of charged light particles. Why is that? Everything does Bremsstrahlung. Remember from, from electrodynamics again. Every charged particle undergoes Bremsstrahlung. But the smaller the mass, the higher the Bremsstrahlung. Yes. For the kind of energy that we are not interested, but the kinds of energy that we are uh, available, that we have available today, or until the late past, things are changing fast. Until the early pa uh, recent past, you didn't need to care about neon bremsstrahlung. Neons simply wouldn't bremsstrahlung. You would that you wouldn't you wouldn't reach. See here, you would almost never reach the energy. Tevatron was here, 900 GV. You would almost never reach the energy where mean bremsstrahlung was a problem. With the LHC, it's changed, okay? Mean bremsstrahlung is a problem that we have to model. But it's always a problem for electrons and photons. Sorry, for electrons and positrons. Because then it starts radiating. And while the ionization loss decreases logarithmically with the energy, the Bremsstrahlung increases linearly with energy, more or less. And for electrons, this effect kicks in super fast, like uh, 1, 2, 5 GV. So for high energies for electrons and positrons, above 1 GV, which is nothing. Remember, the, the LHC collides particles at 14,000 GV, 14 GV center of mass. It's only Bremsstrahlung. And one way to, <coughs> to think about it is to think about a critical energy where the electron ionization loss becomes equal to the Bremsstrahlung. There is an equation for that, but what I mean is this co crossing point here. It's very early. Now, you can approximate the, the radiation energy, so the Bremsstrahlung energy loss as this. And if you actually plug in everything that you need to plug in here, you'll find out that it's proportional to E over M square. And that's what I again meant by light particles radiate much, uh, much more. 
an, in an interesting thing that you can rewrite this in terms of this x0, which is the radiation length, which is defined like this. But then this is easy, right? This you can integrate, and you get this kind of, a, of expression. The energy of the electron, when it's going through the bulk matter, it it's proportional to the initial energy, and it decays exponentially with the radiation length. Obviously, I put this in, in, the, in the small shout out, but uh, you guys know, right? So if you go through one radiation length, you your energy is reduced to one over E of the original energy. But of course, this is an exponential decay. This radiation length, if you unpack it a little bit, you'll see that it only depends on the density of the material. Of course, the constant, but that doesn't matter. And the atomic, and uh, atom the atomic number, and which element it is. And of course, this small z here is the particle that is going through, but z squared is usually one. So one way to characterize your material for stopping electrons and positrons, the way to do it is to uh, characterize this radiation length here. So save this in the back of your minds. Since we're speaking about electrons and positrons, might as well go the full, go, go the full way and speak about photons. Photons at low energies, and again, the resolution sucks. Photons at low energies, there are two effects, okay? Either you have the photoelectric effect, where the photon is absorbed and it knocks out an electron from the, from the atom, which then becomes an ion. The energy is this, you know this from modern physics. And the cross action, if you approximate it to, for high energy photons, and high energy here, quote unquote, because this is around what, uh, one MeV at most, this is peanuts for me. So that's why the quote unquote there. It goes with one over this, the energy of the photon. And again, you can run the quantum mechanics calculations to get that, but that's not the point here. Then Compton scattering kicks in. And Compton scattering is more or less the same process, but the photo is re-emitted. You know this again from modern physics. And if you do the approximation for high energy photons, you will see that the sigma, the total cross action, or how, which is a measure of the probability of the photon actually interacting like this, goes with this expression here, which is log, logarithm of s over s, where s is the square root of the center of mass. If you plot this thing, the square root, no, sorry, the square of the center of energy, center of mass energy of the electron photon kicking here. If you plot this thing, you'll find out that it has a maximum, and it's what we are seeing here. But all of these, pro these processes, they are low energy, and low energy for collider things, like collider experiments, like the, let's see, what kicks in is pair production. S remember that we were speaking yesterday about uh, uh, pair production, creating particles where nothing existed before. Here it kicks in beautifully. The point is a photon can interact with a nucleus and give rise to an electron positron pair plus a nucleus like this. Then you have the kinetic energy to be transferred to the target. It has to be large. It only happens when the energy of the photon is larger than the threshold of producing these two guys. And then, which is 500, uh, two times 511 kilo electron volts like this. If you again run the cross section calculation of this process here, which is what we're talking about, there is an X here because of this material photon. This is electromagnetic field from the nucleus you get this expression here, which is independent of the energy, and that you can recast like this, seven ninths, proportional to the inverse of the, of the radiation length. How come the radiation length appears? And the reason is because there is a symmetry in between these two diagrams. They, were, they are identical except that one is spin with respect to the other. 
like physically rotated here. Uh, but this is just a picture. The point is that there are the symmetry principles of QC QED show that these two processes have to be related. So pair production has to be related to uh, I should not drink so much coffee in the beginning. <laughs> Sorry. It has to be related with Bremsstrahlung. Bremsstrahl. Okay? Now, pay attention to this. The same quantity is responsible for characterizing both the interactions of electrons and photons in a material. So, all the electromagnetic interactions for electrons and positrons. If the dominant process at high energies for photons is pair production like this, and the, for electrons and positrons is Bremsstrahlung like this, you can have the, and you have high enough energy in the beginning, you can see that you can introduce scalar variables like length in, term, in terms of length of interaction, energies in terms of critical energy, and you have a photon which is in, uh, gets in the material here at uh, one interaction length it opens up in a, in a pair electron positron. These guys are also high energy, so they radiate. It, then after another, so you see how it goes, right? After one uh, critical length, uh, sorry, radiation length, they radiate again, and the photon they radiated, they radiated open up, and again, and again, and again. And this is a chain reaction, or what we call in the jargon, a shower. An, uh, an electron or a photon, it doesn't matter with what you begin. When it goes into both matter, it showers. And you can describe this, this shower, this electromagnetic shower, in terms of the critical energy and the uh, radiation length. And this, uh, here is a simulation of an electron inside, in, in, impinging in a CMS crystal. This is made of lead glass. This is a simulation, of course impinging in light glass, and the radiation length here is really small, it's one centimeter. So that means that you can make a crystal which is this size, and come on, when you go 15 radiation lengths on, on an exponential process, that means that all of the energy is deposited in this crystal in the form of this, in the end here, low energy particles. Of course, when the shower ends, then you have the low energy process. But the point that the energy stops there. And you can see here why, for instance, we chose this, right? I mean, you can make small crystals. Imagine if we had chosen something else. But of course, it's an engineering problem. You have to make do with uh, what's best for your budget. Then for hadrons, the story is more or less the same. The difference is that it's not QED, so we don't have the analytics, analytical expressions for almost anything. But you can simulate, you can make approximations. So the story is more or less the same. If an adron interacts with a nucleus, either it's an elastic interaction, and then the cross section is something like 10 millibar. It's actually a bit less here, eight, seven, you see there. And or an inelastic interaction where the nucleus breaks up. At high energy, there's also something called a diffractive contribution, but uh, it's not really interesting for us at this moment. And this thing here, this total cross-section of an adron interacting with both matter, is dominated essentially by the inelastic part. The inelastic part grows up slowly, but it does, and it's, <coughs> it's uh, proportional to A, to the power of two thirds. What's the power of two thirds? The idea is that uh, to a very first crude approximation, you can treat this cross-section as a hard disk cross-section. It is almost, but not quite, as if literally the nucleus was a disk. And if the proton overlaps, it interacts. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Of course, there is much more to this, okay? Hadron physics, nuclear physics of this kind, is a whole new world. But for the purposes of this talk, 
in the preliminary study, this is enough. And then if you run the calculations, you'll see that this eight to the two thirds comes out easily. And then of course, you have this uh, scaling process here. The total cross-section of a proton impinging on a material of atomic, num atomic number A is proportional to the cross-section of proton-proton, which we can measure, for instance, the LHC, times the scaling factor. And if you redefine everything in terms of uh, it interacts and then it uh, takes out a proton out of the nucleus or a neutron, doesn't matter. You run all of the, of the rational again, you get this interaction length, which has this formula here, and which is proportional to A of, uh, to the power of one third. I didn't say this before, sorry. I think I forgot to put it on the slides. Besides how long the shower goes through, goes through in the material, the electromagnetic, you can also have a parameter that tells you how much it opens up. This is called the Molière radius, but it's also related to the interaction length. Because of course, it doesn't matter if I'm going on this on that or that direction. It's just a property of the material. And the same thing here for this interaction length, lambda E. And then you run exactly the same, uh, the same, uh, the same calculations. But now the thing is that you can compare the interaction length with the radiation length. And you will see that this ratio goes like A to the four thirds. A is a big number, right? A starts with hydrogen with one, but quickly gets to 10, 20, 100. So the bottom line is that the interaction length of hadron uh, interactions is much larger than the one for electromagnetic uh, <coughs> electromagnetic uh, interactions. So that means that to completely stop a hadronic shower, you need much, 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 much more matter than to stop an electromagnetic shower. So your calorimeter, we'll see this later, the thing that you use to stop and measure the energy of these particles has to be bigger. Luckily, for it can also be made cheaper, but then it would be a problem. You can stop me at any time to ask questions, sorry. Now I want to go through a few practical examples of uh, materials and subdetectors that we can use to, we start with a tree, right? It has to be done by four, oh my God. Uh, some practical examples of uh, the subdetectors, so of uh, systems that we can use. The first one is scintillators, okay? What are scintillators? Scintillators are materials that they receive these particles, they are subjected to these particles, and the reaction, the reaction after you do all the electromagnetic shower or the hadronic shower, doesn't matter, but the reaction is that they shine. They scintillate, they, do, they have Lum, lum, fluorescence, sorry, fluorescence. So it converts the energy of the particle into light. And what do you do with light? You put a photosensor there, you measure those photons, and it will give you a electric pulse. What do you do with this electric pulse? We will see later. Uh, how come this happens? <laughs> the, the, it's as simple as this. The particle interacts with the, with the material, the electron jumps to this level, then goes back and gives you a photon. There's nothing different from that. Okay, but uh, what's the difference? This can happen everywhere. Yes, there it's true, but for a scintillator has special qualities. First, it's not obvious, but it has to be transparent to its own light. Think about it. If I have something that uh, shines in the blue, right, shines blue, but it ab also absorbs blue, then from the outside I'm seeing nothing. So it's useless for me. I need something that is transparent to its own light. And this is particularly the case of CMS. Our crystals that we have in one of our systems, they 
have these very specific properties, the lead gland that I spoke about before, which technically is tungstat of glands. Sorry, tungstat of uh, lead tungstat. Second, this conversion must be efficient. It doesn't matter if a particle goes through and ha makes only one photon and then I cannot detect that photon, then it's useless. So there has to be a measure of efficiency. And the photons that are emitted must have the right uh, wavelength and energy to be detectable by a photosensor that we put here. So this is how it goes, scintillator, everything is encased in a shield, some kind of photosensor, and here you have electronics to actually feed it to the system. Scintillators are used everywhere, okay? You can make uh, particle counters, image displays, you can make trackers out of it, you can use to measure energy because this light, the, the amount of light emitted is a function of the energy of the particle. And then you can calibrate this and measure it. It's not necessarily linear, but it, it may be close to linear. And then the, the amount of light is proportional to the energy of, uh, of the impinging particle. I'm not going to speak more about this. There are types of scintillators, inorganic, liquid noble gases, organic. The, you can, I'm just putting these words here because then if you're interested, you can follow and you can search for more. What other kinds of detectors exist? Gas chambers. Same story, but here is a bit easier. You have this gas, you apply a field, and then a, par a charged particle goes through. What it will do is that it will ionize this gas, and if, since there is a field here, what happens is that electrons go in one direction and ions go in the other. And then these electrons impinge in the, in the anode or cathode. I never remember which is which. Uh, they impinge on the, on the plates and a lot of electrons impinging on the plate is a current. And a current I can go and measure, beam, I'm done. Same for the ions, but the ions move slowly. So you actually have two signals, which may be bad, but on the other hand, you can correlate these signals to get more information. And it depends on everything. It depends on which gas is here, which temperature, which pressure, which voltage difference you apply between these two. The different ways, particularly if you calculate the, if you make a, a plot of the, of the number of ions collected as a function of the voltage you apply, you see that there are different uses. You can have, for instance, the number of ions collected to be more or less proportional to the voltage in this region. You can have this region where you have an avalanche. You can have this region where there is no proportionality. It's almost, uh, it's almost constant. It depends on what you want to use your, your detector for. If to count only or if to measure the actual energy or, or, moment, or and the actual energy deposited in this system. And there, of course, you can imagine that this is not easy to model. There is a lot of stuff that may or may, that may, or may not happen depending on how did you design your detector. One particular, for instance, I'm going to speak only of two things here. For instance, sometimes it may be that the, electron doesn't, the electrons and the ions don't reach the plate because your voltage is too small, so they actually manage to find other, recombine, and then become an atom again, and then stops. The, the, that is, this is a diffusion process, so you have to use your statistical mechanics to actually make this calculation. So it's hard business. But one thing that I want to draw your attention is that this drift, opa, this drift here is, a, is electrons moving in a, electrons and ions moving in a, in a gas. So it's, and you cannot crank the, vo the, the voltage here as, as much higher, much higher to make them go faster because eventually you have a dielectric rupture and then it doesn't work anymore. So this is slow in in compared to what I'm going to show you next, which is this. 
You can do the same thing with semiconductors. What's good about semiconductors? They are radiation damage resistant. You can put this thing uh, inside the highest radiation doses that you can have nowadays in a lab, and it will take it like a champ. On top of that, you can produce to the few micrometers of precision. You can make pixels of 50 micrometers per 50 micrometers out of this. You can thank Intel for that, right? <laughs> Why? Because uh, I'm speaking here semiconductor, but it's silicon, right? It's silicon wafers. This, unfortunately, is the reason why it's expensive. Silicon wafers of high purity are expensive. But if you can afford it, it's the best kind of the, the it's a, an amazing detector. And here again, if a, if a charged particle goes through, it will leave a signal. It's sort of like the gas detector. We'll see later. But the thing that since this is a semiconductor, you have to think about the energy bands. I take that, uh, do I need to speak about energy bands or does everybody know enough solid state physics and then we can just skip? Has there a raise your hands if you have taken a solid state physics course? Okay, half of you, so let's speak about it. Uh, so it's this, is there a question? Okay, so this is it. How do you model uh, a solid, a crystalline solid? Either you, so you have the states, and these states are all filled by the electrons until they, until they are not, and then there is a gap because these states are, they are the quantum mechanics energy states, and sometimes there are gaps, and what may happen is that all of the all of these electrons are uh, this is the valence band. All of these electrons they are sort of uh, fixed. They are not uh, delocalized, and therefore they are not free to conduct current. So this is an insulator. On the other hand, if there is no gap, some electrons are delocalized and they can move around the crystalline net, the crystalline net, and then it's a <coughs> conductor. The middle case, the semiconductor is interesting because they are separated pero no mucho. So just some thermal fluctuations here may make them jump from one band to the other. But you can help. You can dope the semiconductor. So for instance, silicon. Silicon is this and it forms this tetravalent bond and makes a lattice. But you can insert, you can dope different uh, elements. And what happens when you do this is that either you have missing electrons or extra electrons. And this is what's called a p-type or n-type uh, doping. And this thing creates an extra electron while this thing creates a hole. And the thing is that you can consider these holes more or less like Particles as well, positive particles, because if you have an electron missing, eventually this electron can move here, but that means that the whole moves here, so you can treat it as a quasi-particle in a sense. And it's useful, in it helps you model it to treat it like this. The point is that if you put one of these N materials in contact with a P material, you have a depletion region, a depletion where there are no electrons and holes. You apply the voltage. And then when a particle goes through, it ionizes this region in a sense, but what it creates is electrons and holes again, which then go to their respective pole. And then this gives a, this gives a signal. But the thing is that remember, this is silicon, so you can machine it to be micrometers. So you can actually see when a charged particle passes through to the tune of micrometers of precision. This is amazing. Why did I speak about scintillators before? Because scintillators, they can scintillate even with uh, <coughs> neutral particles. 
depends on the kind of scintillator, but they are susceptible to neutral particles. The uh, gas chambers and the semiconductors are not. They only activate, they only work with charged particles. Keep that in mind because neutrals, detecting neutral particles is a hard problem, especially in the context of the LHC. Maybe I could, uh, maybe I could skip this. Then, then you can calculate the drift speed here, and it's actually much, much, much higher. So these detectors are fast. You can see that it saturates at uh, 10 to the 7 centimeters per microsecond, which is a lot. And the drift time is super small, 10 nanoseconds for you to give a signal. Remember, the LHC for context, it collides a bunch of particles every 25 nanoseconds. So it's good because you get your signal 10, in 10 nanoseconds, which is before the next collision happens. Gas chambers, for instance, they need some relaxation time. When the particle goes through, they need some extra time to relax. And on top of that, when you get this signal, you get the best of both worlds because there are the holes, sorry, there are the electrons, and the holes move a little bit, uh, <coughs> a little bit slower. So you get a fast rise where you get most of your charge, but then you get an extra bit later coming from the holes. Since it rises very fast, around one nanosecond, that means that it can take particles coming in like a champ again. And why is this important? Because you can put them very close to your interaction point. And then there will be a lot of particles coming through just because the flux of particles goes with one to the R square, right? If you're farther away, you see less particles than if you're close, just because of the geometry of space. And then you can count particles much, uh, with much faster. And remember, this thing is radiation damage resistant, so it can withstand being there, having particles going through at an amazing rate. So this already gives us some kind of, uh, sorry that I'm being a bit late. This already gives us a little bit of uh, <coughs> ideas on how to combine all of these things. We can have trackers. You can measure the charged particles. You choose a material, silicon or gas, but something that has low uh, interaction length, such that the particle leaves a signal, but it doesn't shower that much. It's not destroyed along the way. It passes, ionizes, gives a signal, but it continues with most of its energy intact. And then you have a particle that's passing through you. You can measure where it's passing through. You can track the particle. There is a caveat here that usually you want to put a magnetic field because you will see on the next slide, but you want to track the particle and you want to measure its momentum. To measure a momentum of a moving charged particle, you usually need a magnetic field if you don't want to change its momentum, right? And then, as I said, you can have semiconductor trackers that you can use when you're close to the interaction point and the particles are coming through very, at a very high rate, but it's expensive. Or you can use gas trackers for when you are farther away. And that's cheaper, but it's not, not as good. Of course, there exist a million other possibilities, okay? But there is a lot of R&D happening here. And then you can have calorimeters. You can have big slabs of mm, materials where your idea is to stop the particles, give you a big signal, which is a function of the energy. But it destroys the particle. It stops there and you lose it. So it has to be dense because you want it to have uh, to stop the particles effectively, and this goes into the interaction length or radiation length. And it has to be active, so it has to shine or it has to give us an electrical signal, something. A problem. It's a bit hard to get a material that has these two uh, properties. So this gives rise to the idea of calorimeters, which are uh, uh, detectors, systems which me that measure the energy of a particle. And you can either have sampling calorimeters where you have two materials playing these two different roles, alternating, or you can have a homogeneous calorimeter that has only one material that's both active and absorber. Uh, 
it's not easy to find a good material to make a homogeneous calorimeter. Usually there are constraints that you have to follow. Both CMS and Atlas have some. Our homogeneous calorimeter is uh, made of lead glass. This is what I mean. You the particle goes through, it try a, a series of discrete elements, and you measure that it passes through here, 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 it's making a curve because there is a magnetic field here. You can have a calorimeter with absorber layer and active layers. And then in the absorber layers, it showers. In the calorimeter, uh, in the active layers, it gives signal. And you can make complicated geometry. Ge geometry. This is Atlas. This is a part of the Atlas calorimeter. It's made like an accordion in order to maximize the, the interactions and the signals that you get. And now you integrate everything. What's the plan? So we want to measure the energy, the momentum, the charge, and the mass, but you don't measure the mass. You take it from the momentum and the energy. Of all particles produced, obviously you want to take the non-destructive measurement before. So implement a tracker with a material of small x0 and small lambda interaction. Track the particle, literally follow it to this. Measure its momentum. And then make it undergo a shower, and you tune your calorimeter in order to be better for electrons and positrons and photons, or better for hadrons. Because you have two handles, x0 and lambda int. And you're set. You can detect all of those particles that I, that I spoke to you before. There are these two special cases, neons. Neons have amazingly high range, okay? You need 12 meters of pure copper <laughs> to stop uh, a mu of 20 GeV. 12 meters is big. Uh, so usually we don't try to measure the energy of mules, and the more energy the mule has, the, the worse. Usually we don't try to measure the energy of the mules in the calorimeters. Instead, what we do is that we make a gigantic calorimeter that stops, e that manages to stop everything but the mules. And then you put another tracker after. <laughs> and then only the mules survive. So whatever passes through is a mule. And then you retract the mule there. The other problem is neutrinos. Neutrinos, you need uh, kilometers. <laughs> no, kilometers is too little. Light years <laughs> of uh, lead to stop them. So you don't. So they just go through. There are detect, uh, neutrino detectors, but it's zillions of neutrinos go through, and once every while, one signal goes. Well, uh, you have one signal of a neutrino. Stuff like Kamiokan, the mini boon. This is different. And then you integrate everything. So here is an example of CMS. So let's stay here for a little while. We have a silicon tracker in the beginning. It tracks all of the charged particles. These neutral hadrons or photons go through, don't leave a signal. The curvature here depends, of course, on the charge of the particle. And then you have an electromagnetic calori calorimeter. You have something with big X0, big radiation length, but small uh, lambda interaction. And this stops the lightest charged particles and the photons. So both the photons and the, and the charged particles, both, both photons and electrons and positrons, yeah, they stop here and they shower. Then you have a hadron calorimeter, then you tune it the other way around, and you stop all of the hadrons, both charged and neutrals. Mules go through all of it, and then you have another tracker outside here with another, uh, <coughs> with another magnetic field. But here you are much farther away, and only the mules pass through. So here you don't need silicon. You can make do with, for instance, gas chamber. And then you have to correlate all of these signals in order to understand what came through here. And there is a magnetic field that uh, you can see here, for Tesla in this direction, and this is a gigantic solenoid. We even use the fact that field, the magnetic field has to close, right? So what we actually do is that we reuse the magnetic field that has to close, so it goes and comes back through this iron return yoke here. 
And, but here's, of course, it's going back, so it's on the other direction. So the new turns in the other direction. And then you have to correlate all of this data to find out what came out from these particles in here, from this collision dark. Tools of the trade, of course. Nobody does these calculations by hand. There, are, there is only one, one and a half uh, game in town. Geant is the standard. If you want to simulate the interaction of radiation particles with bulk matter, you use Geant. Use Geant for everything, okay? High energy physics, nuclear physics, accelerator physics, space physics, medical physics, if you want to see how, how bone will react to radiation. Geant does everything. The problem is that Geant is so slow. <laughs> how slow? We have to simulate billions of collisions for the LHC per, per year. Every uh, simulation of the CMF detector in Jean takes more or less one minute. So we're talking billions of minutes. And yes, we have a lot of computer power, but still it's slow. Especially if you want to make some preliminary designs. You don't need ultimate precision. So there is an alternative, and this one is just for high energy physics, which is called Delphys. And if you remember in the previous uh, talk, one of the programs for this, one of the softwares for the simulation was called Pythia. So yeah, there is a running joke in here, Pythia and Delphys. Delphys allows you to make a fast simulation, but for high energy physics detectors only. It includes tracking, magnetic field, calorimeters, and muons. This is fast, but then of course the precision is much smaller. This is a very open problem, okay? There are, may, there are many ways, there are many people, I'm one of them. This is actually one of the problems that I'm trying to tackle. How to combine the speed, the speed of the Delphys, but with the precision of something like Geant. It's not easy, okay? There are some people coming from the computer science side that, that say, oh, it's easy, let's parallelize everything. Yeah, parallelizing, paral parallel programming is not for the weak of heart. Uh, but these are, for instance, if you are a phenomenologist, you probably are going to use Delphys. If you are designing a detector, eventually you have to use Geant. So bottom line, we managed to detect the particles and now it's time to reconstruct the data, which is the subject of the next lecture. I would like to explicitly, especially thank the grad students of my group because they really helped me to put this talk together and of course, they also learned uh, all of this that a good high energy physicist has to learn. So if there is anybody in the audience from this team, thank you very much, and thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, questions? In the sense that uh, it's much harder to detect them in the sense that you cannot use trackers. You have to use uh, calorimeters. And trackers are very useful because they are precise. They give you micrometers in the position of the, of the particle. It's amazing. Of course, you can just put a big calorimeter. And you can segment your calorimeter a bit, OK? You can, oh, you can have small crystals and give you some precision on the position. But it doesn't compare with 50 micrometers. Mm -hmm. So neutrals are a bit harder, but we manage to detect them, except the neutrino, of course. And how do you manage to collide them? We don't accelerate them. Um, speaking about, you collide the proton with the, pro with the protons, a lot of particles come out, and some of them are neutral. There is a way to make beams of neutral particles, but it's different. You have to accelerate particles of, uh, you have to accelerate charged particles, collide them with something, then a lot of particles will come out, some of those are neutral, you use magnets to take everybody out who's charged, and then you have a beam of neutral particles, which is a bit spread, but works. So you don't accelerate them, but you can make a beam. Next. Oh. Are there 
the tau lepton, it doesn't uh, fly enough for us to detect it in bulk matter. What can be done is that the tau decays, and then you get the, the daughters of the tau, in a sense. You reconstruct them, and uh, you manage to see, oh, it's a tau. A tau usually decays into either one or three ch uh, charged particles, pions. So a tau in your detector looks like a hadronic jet, but very thin and very, and very narrow. And there is one extra thing. Sometimes the tau is always, when the tau decays because of conservation of lepton number, there will always be at least a tau neutrino in the end. And that guy is undetectable. So there is also a bit of energy imbalance in your event that is related to the fact that the tau is there. So you can also use that. So bottom line, no, not directly, but indirectly you can reconstruct it. Delta electrons are a very particular, we can, open, we can open up the equations here later. Delta electrons are a very particular kind of uh, electron that come from the ionization of the material. They are related with one particular process. The bottom line is that you don't, uh, you don't kinda have to take care of, of them. They sort of go uh, together with the rest of the shower. It's super detailed, doesn't, but for the purposes of this talk, it doesn't matter. In our experiment for Tesla, design is for Tesla. Unfortunately, this obviously didn't work as expected. <laughs> so it goes with 3.8 Tesla. Why is that? Because for you, don't, you don't have a random magnet and four Tesla. No, it has to be superconducting. And superconductivity is hard. So we tried to go to four Tesla, it didn't work, it quenched, and uh, with bad results for everybody. But the, remember that the magnet of the LHC are even stronger to bend the, to bend the beam they need eight Tesla for the 70 EV beam. So yeah, it's wrong. The answer is yes, you can track it because you know from Nader's theorem that if you have a conserved number, if you have a conserved quantity, you have a symmetry behind it. You may not have this symmetry put by hand. It may be accidental. The, you put by hand in the standard model those three symmetries that I spoke about yesterday. It turns out that lepton number comes out as conserved in there. But the point is, for me, that doesn't matter. I'm an experimentalist. I don't buy that. I search. So up until now, lepton number symmetry is a very good symmetry. It's, it's a true symmetry. But there are experiments, for instance, in neon. I don't remember the name of the experiment, but it's the thing, uh, it's the thing searching for this. Neon going to electron gamma. This is forbidden in the standard model because of the symmetry. But it doesn't matter, we are searching for it because if we find it, that means that the electron the standard model is not, not quite right. Next. their own light, yes. Um, 
it means it could absorb it, yes, but then the, the efficiency for the absorption, absorption of that light might be much smaller, and then it works. And that's the, the, the thema, this thing here. This thing here is all built on that. This LED glass shines blue, but uh, it's amazingly transparent for blue. Blue, I think, is 435 nanometer. Mm. How is the spectrum like this in the same fashion as, as the power of the Higgs boson? Yes, everything is like that. So the Higgs almost instantaneously decays into whatever it decays. Let's say into Z bosons. The Z bosons decay into, into whatever they want. That is branching ratio that, uh, that govern all of those things. And then, for instance, the Z's decay into leptons. So to search for the Higgs boson, you search for two pairs of leptons of the same flavor opposite sign, and you try to make these out of them. So you try to find them with this mass. You cannot for both of them because it turns out that the Higgs boson is not enough, is not heavy enough to give two Z bosons with the right mass. So one of them is virtual, and we will learn what virtual means in QFT. It turns out that they have to be out of the mass shell, but it's not a problem. And then you when you make the four, when you sum the four four vectors that you selected, given that at least one pair has to be like this, then you see that you have a peak, which means a resonance, which means a particle being produced like this. Right? So this resonate, this would resonate, but this guy is virtual, so it doesn't have the right mass, and this resonates. And then, you, and then you see the peak. That's how we search for particles, for the Higgs boson. And all particles, of course, then there is it's not resonance, but uh, it doesn't matter. You search for the daughters. Okay, so I will be here for a little while more. And uh, please co come talk to me, ask me questions. I love answering questions and uh, discussing and everything, uh, except the uh, questions about super, okay, I mean, big picture, please. Okay. Sobre o KNN reserve, eu só queria tirar a questão da, da dome shell, né? Do off shell. Né? É. Seria porque se detecta partículas que vêm depois disso? Não, você sempre detecta partículas que vêm depois disso. A diferença é que lembra que você tem a, o processo acontece. Só que quando a partícula está on shell, quando a cinemática do disco está do jeito que ela está, essa luz que é detecta, a partícula está sumindo. Isso é uma ressonância. Então, esse cara aqui, sempre que ela fica muito perto da massa esférica, fica é melhor ainda. Mas a foto aconteceu mesmo com ele, o processo pode acontecer mesmo onde estamos com a massa gata. Mas isso é uma coisa de quantum field theory. Você faz a conta e você vê que isso acontece. Né? 